dismiss our young people to their class. And I'll try not to be offended by that little cheer that Liam let out there. <laughs> I'm sure it's not my preaching that he's saying thank you about, but I hope not anyway. <laughs> Beyond the open door, that's it's a thought that for a lot of people is scary. When you consider that a door opened to a new life, to something that you haven't experienced maybe, going to a place that God wants you to go that maybe you haven't even considered, and to think, maybe I've got to leave it all behind. It's a scary thought, but I can assure you that if God is opening the door, he has something far better, far greater than you could even imagine for your life. And I love Again, just love when Sister Zopkin picks out songs that correspond so well with what God has laid on my heart. So, We can turn in our Bibles this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 9. Makes it even more, um, I guess, humbling that God would do that when I had a different message thought and when I was trying to put it together the other day, it just wasn't coming. And so I sat and prayed and, and opened up my Bible and started doing some more reading. And God laid another thought on my mind. And that's where I ended up going for this morning. So it's just a nice confirmation that God knows what he's doing. So Acts chapter 9, we're going to be getting reading there at verse number 1. It says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him unto Damascus. Now if we can turn down just a few verses in that same chapter down to verse number 19. It says, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for your hand upon us today and for your presence in this house. Lord, we ask that you would reach down, that you would touch every heart and every mind, anoint every ear to hear today, God. Help us to draw near to you and to seek your word and your desire for our lives. God, I ask you would anoint my mind this morning and touch my tongue, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'd like to speak to you for just a little while this morning on what I have titled Change. A simple title, but a big word. Change. 
I want to read to you a poem this morning. I'm sure many of you will have likely heard it before, but I believe that it applies to this message. It says, "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good folk, he cried, who will start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, now two. Only two? Two dollars, and who will make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as an angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer with a voice that was quiet and low said, what am I bid for the old violin, as he held it up with the bow? A thousand dollars, and who will make it two? Two, two thousand, and who will make it three? Three thousand once, and three thousand twice. Three thousand and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some exclaimed, we do not quite understand. What changed its worth? And the answer came, "Twas the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with a soul out of tune and battered and scarred by sin is auctioned cheap by the thoughtless crowd, just like the old violin. But the master comes and the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. You see the touch of the master always changes the value of what has been touched. In the hands of a skilled craftsman, old cards and old furniture can be made more valuable, restored to pristine condition. We've seen, many of us here have seen what Sister Zotsman can do with an old dresser, an old table. A little bit of time, a little bit of effort, knowing what it is she wants to do, knowing what it is that she wants to accomplish, can turn something that somebody else has discarded into something worthwhile. I've had friends in my years, um, bodymen friends, that I've seen them take vehicles that they paid next to nothing for because they were old, they were rusty, they were beat up, dented, scarred, wounded from years of trouble, year, years of abuse, years of neglect. And they turn it into something that's beautiful, something that's j almost like a work of art with their hands and what they could do with that metal and what they could do. You see, it's the hand of a craftsman that can change the value of anything. And there is no greater craftsman than our God. He is the one that formed man out of the dust of the earth. He is the one that breathed that breath of life into our lungs. And he is the one that can take a wounded and battered soul and make it new again. He is the one, the craftsman, the master that can affect every one of our lives. You see, many of us were worthless in the eyes of the world. If you don't have perfect hair, flawless skin, you're worth nothing. If you don't live in a big house or drive an expensive car, you're worthless. If you're not aspiring to advance your career and be willing to do anything to make it happen, we don't want you. And many of us through our lives have been beat up and we have the nicks and the dents and the scars to prove it. See, the world will cast you aside in an instant once it gets what it wants from you and then consider you worthless, garbage, nothing. But then along comes the master. You see, a touch from the master is not going to give you a new house. It's not going to give you perfect hair or flawless skin. But it will help you to realize that you are valuable to God. And that is the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter what the world out there is going to say about you because the master thinks you're valuable. The master thinks that you are priceless. The master cares for your soul. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse number 12. 
It says, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. He will make you precious. 1 Peter 2 and 4 says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. That's you. Disallowed by men, cast aside by men, pushed down, beat up, wounded, but God says you are still precious in my sight. I still care for you. I'm still reaching for you. And just from the touch of the master, you can be changed. When the master comes into your life, just like the song that we sang, he opens the door. He says, now it's up to you to just step on through. I've got something far better for you. Just walking through that door will bring you to a new life. Walking through that door will bring you into my kingdom. Walking through that door will take you where it is that I want you to go. And I will lead you and guide you and have my hand upon you. So you can be changed from what the world views as worthless to precious in the eyes of God. See, a gentleman in the Bible by the name of Jacob, under the influence of his mother, had the view of, I will get what I want, and I'll do anything to get it. The worldview. That's the way the world sees things. We've been, uh, probably all heard the slogan of Nike, just do it. I think it's Burger King's slogan, you can have it your way. That's not the way God works. But that's the way the world views it. That's what the world pushes on you, is go after what you want, take what you want, doesn't matter who you hurt, doesn't matter who you have to step on, go for what you want. This is the attitude that Jacob had as he, as he was one day just making up a pot of pottage there, the Bible says, and he's stirring it up, making it, probably smelled wonderful. And in comes Esau, his brother, having been out hunting and, and didn't find anything, and he comes in and he says, I'm starving, and that smells so good. Please give me some of what you've made. Jacob, being the cunning man that he was, well, I'll give you some if you'll sell it to me, or I'll sell it to you, rather. For what? Give me your birthright, and I'll give you some food. The Bible says that Esau despised his birthright because he was willing to sell it cheap. See, then Jacob would go on to then steal the firstborn's blessing by impersonating his brother. His mother, again, conniving the scheme. Oh, we'll just put some fur on you, and, and you go in unto your father. He's blind. He won't know who it is, and when he feels you, he'll know. He'll think that it's Esau, and he went in and deceived his father to steal the blessing from his brother. Goes on. That's the world view. That's what the world's going to do. Esau is the one that was beat up and bruised and broken by what his brother did, did to him. That's what the world is going to do to us. And then we are left wondering what happened in our lives. But you see, then we come into the Bible and we step into the story of Jacob as he flees his home. As we look into the book of Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, begin reading at verse number 10. It says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth at the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. 
And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth to thee. So we find Jacob. In this encounter with God, on, his, on the road as he's fleeing from his brother that wants to kill him, begins the change in Jacob's life. This is the place of the Lord. How dreadful is this place? And I don't think that, I don't think Jacob was meaning that this is a horrible place. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's in this point where Jacob is beginning to change. Jacob's beginning to realize that the Lord is with me. The Lord is here. The Lord is in this place. The Lord has a plan. God says he will be with me. God will give me all of this. I think what he means by dreadful is that he's now beginning to fear the Lord with a godly fear, beginning to reverence God, beginning to think this could actually take place. If I give my life to God and if I change my life, if I change who I am, then God is going to do all of these things for me. I don't have to be sneaky. I don't have to be conniving. I don't have to be the man that I once was, but I can be changed. And you see, just like Jacob, many of us were living lives that were self-serving. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what makes me feel good. I'm going to do what helps me to get ahead. And our lives were very much all me, I. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. This is what is going to make me happy. And that's the way we lived our lives, and that's what we did. And we get to that place where we realize that we can't go on serving me. And then God comes into our lives and says, I've got a plan for you. And God opens up that door and says, all you need to do is step on through. And I will walk with you and I will be with you, just like he said to Jacob. I will do all of these things for you. You just have to give your life to me. You just have to follow me. You just have to listen to me. You just have to go beside me. You see, we did all of these things because that's what the world around us told us. It's the way we should be. Everywhere we look today, the world is so self-serving and casting aside God. But what does it say in Psalm verse 37? Beginning at verse number 1. It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so that thou shalt dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. In those verses, there's a change that takes place. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. That's what we talked about last week. One of the lies that we tend to believe is I want what they have. I want to do what they're doing. I want to experience what they're experiencing. And we look at where they are and what they're doing, and those are workers of iniquity. And the Bible says that we just read that they will be cut down. It goes on to say, trust in God. Do good. 
Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit the way unto the Lord, trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. A change that happens in our lives when we take our eyes off of what everybody else, when we say, God, I'm going to put my eyes on you. I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to delight myself in you. I'm going to commit my way unto you. And there's a change that happens in our lives as God begins to lead us, as God opens that door, as God walks beside us, making these things come to pass. We get a little confused sometimes about verse number four. When it says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. <laughs> well, I'm going to delight myself in God, and he's going to give me what I want. That's not what that means. It doesn't mean that he's going to give you what you want. But it means that he will give you the desires. He will change the desires. The things that you were seeking after, the things that were going to make you feel good, the things that were going to help you to get ahead, the things that were going to, that it was all me, 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 I, 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 I. He says, now commit your way unto me, and he's going to change those desires. And he's going to put a different desire in your heart, a desire that says, I want to please God, a desire that says, I want to live for God, a desire that says, I want to do what God wants me to do. And there's a change that takes place in your life when you delight in the, in the Lord. See, he can change a drug addict to be clean. He can change an alcoholic to be sober. He can change someone who's greedy to become generous. He took me, a man who at 29 years old, life wasn't really going anywhere. Spending my evenings and my weekends on a bar stool. And God spoke to me. And God led me to a place that I could come and give my life to him. God he brought, spoke into my life in a way that would bring me one day to come to an altar and repent of my sins. And through that, God changed my life. That no longer did I want to go spend my, my evenings and weekends on a bar stool. No longer did I want to have alcohol leading and guiding my life and helping me to make my decisions and to help me to, to use that as a crutch to, to get over my insecurities and the different things in my life that I was trying to escape from. No longer did I need those anymore because now I had God. And God would make a change in my life. He took me, made me a man that would spend all that time in the, on a bar stool to a man that was faithful to God, faithful to church, who no longer drinks and now has a solid career. You see, God took a man who had a volcanic anger issue to someone that is now more reflective and no longer blows his top at, the, at something simple and, and something easy that happens in your life. God made the change. You see, it wasn't self-help books. It wasn't spending hours and, and hundreds of dollars laying on a, on a counselor's um, couch somewhere explaining all my problems to them and them trying to help me. It was God that made that change. It was God that worked a change in my life that took me from one man to another man. It was God that brought me up out of that pit and set my feet upon a rock. It was God that made the change. As I was touched by the Master, and I'm sure that there's many here today that I'm sure can say amen to whatever situation in their life that God has changed. See, when God gets a hold of your life, and when he puts his spirit inside of you, you will be changed. So how does he do that? Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse number 1, says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As God put his spirit inside of them, that's what happened. 
Then they began to speak in other tongues. You will know that God's Spirit is inside of you when you do speak in other tongues. Pastor made the comment before about a renewing and a refreshing, and it, and it triggered a thought in my mind that it doesn't matter what your background is, it doesn't matter what your history is, that we can all be renewed, we can all still be changed. After serving God for 20 years, I can still be changed. God can still work in my life. God can still illuminate my mind. God can still help me to understand things more clearly. You see, when Paul went out and began to, to preach to the Gentiles, and, and he went, he didn't go speaking to them, condemning what their, what, what their past was, what their beliefs were in the past, but he, they, he wanted to add on to it, build upon it, show them a better way. See, Peter went from being a denier to a devout follower. Read in your Bible, before when Jesus was arrested, when he was going and standing before Pilate, when he was in his trial, Peter denied even knowing Jesus, walked with him for three and a half years, spent day and night at his side, saw the miracles that he worked, watched and listened to his teaching, was there with him through, through all of it, and then stood there and was able to stand and say, I don't know who Jesus is. Afraid for his life because he was still in that self-centered attitude of me. What's going to happen to me if I say I know him? Are they going to drag me kicking and screaming down there to be, have to stand beside Jesus to have to withstand whatever fate was going to happen to him? Well, he should have thought about the words that he had just spoken. Jesus, I will go with you anywhere. Wherever you're going, I want to go. He forgot those words because he was still of that attitude of that self-serving attitude and was able to stand there and deny who Jesus was. But then just a few chapters later, we find in the book of Acts that Peter was in that upper room with that 120 assembled together, and it was upon him and the other disciples and that 120 in that upper room that God poured out his spirit and filled him with the Holy Ghost, came out of that room speaking in tongues, came out of that room with a boldness that now it doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what you say, God has changed my life. Knowing Jesus has changed my life. Being filled with the Holy Ghost has changed my life. Then now I'm going to stand up and I'm going to be in front of that multitude. The Bible says that there was over 3,000 souls added to the church that day. That tells me that not everybody in that congregation or that group of people that were there, not everybody's going to accept what he said gladly. So I'm guessing that he probably stood up amongst five, maybe 10,000 people standing there. I'm going to tell you who Jesus is. I denied him back there. I told you I didn't know who he was. But the truth is, I do know who Jesus is. And I'm going to tell you who Jesus is. And I'm going to tell you what Jesus came to this earth to do. And you can accept it or you can do with it what you want. But I'm going to live my life for Jesus. And I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And it doesn't matter what you think or what you say. In a moment, being filled with the Holy Ghost, his life was changed. He throw me in prison. He went to prison. Paul, who we read about at the beginning, Saul, was a persecutor of the church. That's why I say it doesn't matter what your, your past was. We can always still be changed. See, Paul, or Saul, thought he was serving God. He, he was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. He was educated. He was brought up, I believe, to be that kind of a person. Brought up probably in a home where they taught him about God, where he heard about God. He went to school. He learned. He got to the place where he was a leader, and he was thought he was serving God. And he went out there, and he was persecuting Christians, and he was dragging them to prison, and he was watching them being whipped and beaten, and he stood there holding Stephen's clothes as they stoned him. And he watched him die, probably with gladness, thinking, I just did the Lord's work. I'm doing this for God. We just read, he went and got letters. I'm on fire in this. I'm going to take every one of those Christians. I'm going to take every one of them that are, that are preaching Jesus. I'm going to take every single one of them, and I'm going to get them thrown in prison. I'm going to beat them, or I'm going to watch them die. 
And he got his letters, and he's on the road, he's on the march, he's looking for Christians. And then the touch of the master, as that light shone down on him. Who art thou, Lord? Jesus, the one you have been persecuting. And in that moment, he was changed. He went from a man that was hunting Christians. That's why we jump down to verse number 19. Hunting Christians to preaching Christ in a matter of a short period of time. It boggles my mind as well, and, and Pastor has, has brought this up, that it's, it would be really hard for those Christians. I'm going to send you Saul. He's going to come and preach for you guys this weekend. Evangelist coming into town, going to do a, do a revival service for us. Well, who's that evangelist? Oh, it's Saul of Tarsus. Um. <laughs> do realize you're letting the wolf in, wolf in with, uh, with all the sheep here. You're just opening up the hen house for him to come in. Like, um, do you know what you're doing there? Like, um, you're not going to get anybody to come out and listen to him. They've all watched what he's done to their friends, to their families. This Saul person, not going to come anywhere near. But it's through the power of the Holy Ghost that changed the hearts of the men that were leading. When God came and spoke to them and said, no, he's different. He's been changed. You were changed. He's been changed. You can believe what he's going to have to say. You can believe that he's going to come in, that he's not going to be here to persecute you. He's going to come in here and he's going to try to help lead you. And he's going to help try to guide you. And we can use him. And he went and preached Christ to those people. It's interesting because we some, so often look at individuals. I know I've said, this, I've said this just recently, but it's we look at people and say they don't want God. But probably what they're looking for is they want change. They don't know where to find change. They go to the drugs. They go to the alcohol. They go to all these different things because they're looking for change. But God can change them. I keep I, Brother Jack Cunningham's little, the little video clip from one of his services has kind of gone viral. It's being shared everywhere now. And we listened to it live at the minister's retreat last year. He he, still said the same story about going to get his hair cut. Woman with piercings and tattoos and colored hair and everything else. Asked her the question. Or she asked him the question, what do you do? Oh, I work over at this place. Oh, I was just there. <laughs> you were where? <laughs> you don't look like somebody that would frequent our church. I was looking for a Bible. You were looking for a Bible? By the end of the story... He apologized to the young woman. He said, I judged you by how you looked. But I want to give you an assurance. I'm going to leave. I'm going to come back in two hours. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to sit down and have lunch out on that park bench out there. And I'm going to teach you a Bible study. But he looked at her and thought, no. She doesn't want God. So he's just going to go to sleep until she asks the question about where he works. You see, the Holy Ghost will always change you if you let it. If you let the Holy Ghost lead you, if you listen to that voice on the inside, look through your Bible. Those that were touched by Jesus were changed. The woman at the well, the woman with the issue of blood, Zacchaeus, 
multiple blind, there was the lepers, there was lame, those that were possessed, they were all changed by the touch of the master. God did it. God worked in their lives. Some of them came seeking Jesus and some he went seeking them. But the fact that cannot be denied that everyone that Jesus was in contact with was changed. I was even thinking about the, the story about the little boy that came that one day when the multitude were sitting on the hillside and the little boy came with a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. I don't believe he left that place unchanged when he gave up his food that he was probably taking home to his family and when it was all said and done, there was baskets of food left over. What happened to that food? Was it a blessing for that little boy? Had that little boy worked hard to be able to take that home to a starving family? We don't know the story. I'm, I've got a good imagination. And I think about that, that this boy happened to be coming along. Did, was he spending his week and his, all of his effort trying to feed his family? Was he, he working for everything that he had to be able to put enough, to be able to help to put some food on their table? And here he comes along, and, and then the disciples pull him off to the side. Well, this little lad's got some food. Would you be willing to give up your food, boy, for these people? There's a lot of people here. That's okay. We'll just, we'll just bring it to Jesus. We'll see what he can do with it. I believe that there's a significance to the fact that there was 12 baskets of food left over. Because the Bible doesn't tell us what happened with that 12 baskets of food. So on me using my imagination, I think, that boy was willing to sacrifice his couple of fish and his little loaves of bread. Jesus fed the multitude and then said, boy, here's the baskets that you can take home to your family. That little boy's life, I wager, would have been changed by that interaction with Jesus Christ. The multitude sitting on that hillside, their lives would have been changed by that interaction with Jesus Christ on that day. But it's what you do with that interaction. It's what you do with what God's trying to do in your life. Do you commit your way to him? Do you set the desire of your heart upon him? Do you trust in him? Do you give your life to him? That's all in your hands. But I guarantee you, if you do those things, if you do the things that we read in Psalms, trust in him, delight yourself in him, and commit your way unto him, he will change your life, and change it for the better. As we stand together today, I'm going to open this altar. I believe that, that God is here right now. I believe that he's holding the door. He's pushed the door open. Saying it's up to you now. You just have to walk through. You just have to step through to the other side. And I will change your life. What do you need today? Because see, Jesus knows. He sees your dents. He sees your scars. He sees the pain that you bring. And he wants to take those from you. He's that master craftsman. He can take the dents out. He can fix up the scratches. He can polish you up good as new. But you just have to go to him. As the world puts a price on you that is far too low, let Jesus touch your life today. Surrender to him, and he will place a value on your life that is priceless. You see, your life was worth the giving of his own. He gave his life so that yours could be changed. I open this altar and I urge you to come. I urge you to talk to God and open your heart and let him in. He's here right now. All you have to do is reach out and touch him. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. You are mighty God. I lift up your hands.